Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a delight to be here, and I'd uh, like to thank the Sonic Axe Foundation for inviting me. Um, I'm always really uh, delighted to talk about birds, and uh, I'd like to sort of share my own fascination. So, the other thing is it has, because of all this study, it has amazing um, sensory capabilities. It can uh, detect the direction and intensity of the geomagnetic field. Uh, it can see polarized and ultraviolet light. It can detect small changes in atmospheric pressure, less than a millibar. And remember that atmospheric pressure is one bar, so that's less than a thousandth of atmospheric pressure. And it can hear low-frequency in infrasound down to 0.05 hertz. 0 0.05, 0 0.05, that's another just absolutely incredible. Um, some people think that it uses its uh, olfactory ability in navigating, but it really only has average sized olfactory bulbs, so it just has an average sense of smell. Obviously, I, I don't think it uses smell to navigate. Um, so what is the, the basic theory, the basic idea of how it uh, navigates? Um, it uses a map and compass, very similar to what we do. If we're gonna navigate somewhere, the first thing we do is basically look at a map. Where are we now? Where do we wanna go? Where's that place we wanna go in terms of direction? Say to the northwest, we pull out our compass, look at the compass, oh, that's, that direction is northwest, and we go that way. Pigeons do the same thing. And their compasses are pretty well known. Oops. They use the uh, sun azimuth, they have a biological clock, so it's time compensated. So they can look at the direction of the sun and they'll immediately know which way is north, south, east, and west. They can also use the geomagnetic field. We do that as well, but they use the inclination. We use the declination, which is in the horizontal plane. They use the inclination in the vertical plane. Why? It works in both hemispheres, it's great. Um, night migrating birds use the rotation of the stars. It's uh, the home... The homing pigeons uh, only have sun and geomagnetic compasses. <clears throat> so those are the compasses, but what the heck is the map? And that's been the problem. Um, that's been the really enduring mystery in this whole thing. How do they know where they are relative to where they're going? Um, it's been suggested that they use the geomagnetic field they use gradients of the geomagnetic field. There is a gradient from the equator to the pole. There's an ingra that gradient in the change in inclination and also in the intensity of the geomagnetic field. But there's no east-west gradient, so how do they get longitude? And uh, um, human navigators had the same problem. Uh, other people, other biologists have suggested they use olfactory cues. Um, I just don't think this works. Um, how can you use a passively moved um, odor in the atmosphere in an unstable and turbulent atmosphere? It, it, it just doesn't make sense. They have reasons for believing this. They do have evidence that supports this idea, but I, I don't have time to go into why. All I'm trying to say here is that both the current theories, this button, um, both the current theories of the geomagnetic field and olfactory cues have fundamental flaws. So I just don't think they work. Um, you could also think they might use sight, but uh, here if you take a pigeon and put frosted lenses on it so that it, it can see its compass, its, its sun compass, but it can't see landmarks and let it go about 30 kilometers from uh, its loft, it will be able to fly up and circle around its loft but it needs sight to see the loft for its final approach. So this is a good indication of uh, just the accuracy of the, him, uh, the homing pigeon uh, method. So it can get within a kilometer or so of its loft without being able to see it. So whatever it is out there that it's using, that's the accuracy. Um, and finally, what I'm gonna talk about is infrasonic signals. And Raviv has already talked about um, how far they're far traveled in the atmosphere, and since birds and pigeons are far traveled, right off there's sort of, uh, it's making a little bit. Um, at one hertz, the wavelength will be 340 meters. At 0.2 hertz, it'll be about two kilometers, 1.7 kilometers. At 0.01, 
hertz, it would be about 3.4 kilometers. Uh, I've noted here that uh, 1.7 kilometers, 0.2 hertz, is the peak microseism frequency. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, that is what I think the pigeons are using. Um, if you're a physicist, you're going to go, wait a minute. You're telling me that a pigeon that only has a bioral separation of two centimeters can localize a sound source that's coming 1.7 kilometers. It's impossible. Well, it is impossible if you're standing still. But if you move around, you can figure out where that source is by using Doppler shifts. And that's exactly what pigeons appear to be doing. When you release them from a release site, up here, they start circling. And this bird, within one circling, already knows what direction it wants to go home. So if you're moving toward the source, the frequency goes up. If you're moving away from the source, the frequency goes down. It's just the same thing when you hear a siren go by, you hear that um, It's only this time the source is stationary and you're moving. It's exactly the same. So they can tell direction by circling around and when they're going toward and away from a source. You can see here there's a little bit more looping around. I think what they're doing is trying to test wind drift there. They're looking at the ground and seeing how they're being pushed by the wind, because that's another important thing. If you're flying somewhere, you want to know how much is the wind pushing you off course. Um, and uh, the source, the light source is from the north. So all of these white areas throughout this whole thing are basically coplanar and pointed north. So if they're all moving, they're all radiating sound to the north. And in your imagination, I'm sure you can see, if I move the light source around to the east, it would look completely different, but they'd all be lined up going you know, north-south. If I do it from the south again, they would sort of be lined up east-west again, but they'd sort of be on the other side of the ridge from these, and so forth. When you train a racing pigeon, you have to train it in all directions, so it learns what its loft area, in my view, sounds like from each direction. It's like your house. You, front of your house looks like one thing, the back of your house looks like another thing, and the sides look like something else. So anyhow, but you have to have enough area that's generating a large enough sound that the bird can hear. And the farther the bird away, goes away from its loft, the larger area it probably listens to um, generating the sound. And as it gets closer, that area shrinks down until it's about a kilometer across or two kilometers across. As we saw when you covered their eyes, they could get within about a kilometer of their loft. So to recap, uh, they, both birds and infrasound travel for hundreds of kilometers, thousands of kilometers in some cases, in the atmosphere. Pigeons de determine their homeward bearing using Doppler, sh Doppler shifts. The temperature structure and wind structure can cause shadow zones where birds are disoriented. Microseisms from ocean waves cause ground oscillations, which create atmospheric sounds. And I believe that pigeons can acoustically identify their home area the same way we look at it. And this is similar. Bats actually use ultrasound, very high frequency, short wavelength sound to image small insects. I believe birds are using very long frequency sound to image the Earth. If you look at pigeons, uh, here's their homing performance. How well are they grouped? How fast do they get home? versus the months of the year. Uh, inexperienced birds are always worse, so they're down low than experienced birds. But you see there's a, there's a this sine wave. It's, they, get, they do worse in the winter and better in the summer. Why? Because the atmosphere in the winter is much noisier because of all the storms in the oceans. They also don't like to fly over lakes. If you release pigeons on one side of lakes where their home is, they'll fly directly home. And if you release them on the other side, they will fly around the lake to go home. If you put them out in the middle of the lake, they'll just split into two groups and fly uh, to the nearest shore. Why? Because the lake surface, like the ocean surface, is generating microbaroms. It's jamming their homeward signal, so they want to get off that lake as quickly as possible or not go over it in the first place. Uh, here's another very interesting experiment. A uh, Swiss guy named Gerhard Wagner released birds up above a temperature inversion on top of a hill. If they stayed above the temperature inversion, they never made it home. If they went below it, they went right home. Why? Because the temperature inversion will trap the sound underneath it, so the ones above will never hear where their loft is. 
And finally, uh, this is some work I did very early on. The sonic boom, the shock wave off the Concord, will disrupt pigeon races. This is the uh, centenary race of the Royal Pigeon Racing Association, 60,000 birds, they didn't come home. <laughs> that was a big problem. The Queen's birds were out there with them. So what happened? Well, the plane, the sonic, the SST leaving Paris, goes subsonic until it hits the coast and then supersonic and it puts out one heck of a boom of infrasound. The N wave, the overpressure, underpressure wave, uh, that uh, Raviv was talking about. These birds, uh, one of them ended up in South Africa. Why? <laughs> it landed on a boat. Once it hit, <laughs> once it hit the uh, sonic you know, boom, it decided to land. The nearest thing was a boat. It was going for South Africa. Anyhow, um, so I hope that uh, you'll think differently about birds and uh, Thank you very much.